Good morning, church. Thanks for watching our live stream. If it's your first time watching us, make sure to connect with us on foothillonline.org. We're going to go into a time of worship, so open up your hearts and get ready.
enjoyed the time of worship. You can continue to worship by giving on our website at foothillonline.org or text the number down below. We're going to get ready to get into the Word with Pastor Steve. Hey, Foothill family. It's good to have you online in our online service. We're going to talk a little more today about Help is on the Way, Part 4. That's the sermon series that we're in. Today I want to look at the pattern to receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, to receiving Holy Spirit power and help. The pattern to receiving Holy Spirit power and Holy Spirit help. Hey, Jesus promised a helper, and that helper was the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus knew that the disciples as well as you and I would need help. The Bible is very, very clear that that Jesus said, you need to wait for this help, and this Holy Spirit will come. I will will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, Jesus says. I will pour him out on you. I will fill you with the Holy Spirit, and it will give you the help you need to become the person that I've called you to be and to do the things that I've called you to do. So, let me ask you a question this morning. Are, are you one of those people that uh, it's easy for you to ask for help? Or are you one of those people who have a very difficult time asking for help? I've heard this phrase before, God only knows you need help. Well, in many cases, not only, the truth is, is many people around you know you need help, and you just won't ask for it. As a matter of fact, if you're trying to decide whether you're a person who easily asks asks for help or you're somebody who just doesn't ask, um, you you might do this. How many times has somebody walked up to you and said, why didn't you just ask for help? If you have that question posed to you several times throughout your life or every week or month, then you may be one of those people that have a difficult time asking for help. But sadly, as I consider this idea this morning, many Christians live their Christian experience without asking for the Holy Spirit's help. They have, if you will, they've settled for a Christianity, uh, and they've settled for two-thirds of God. We have God the Father, God the Son, but they leave out God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead. You see, being a believer in Jesus Christ and going to heaven, the most wonderful thing about it will be that we have this intimate, ongoing, eternal relationship with God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That will be the greatest gift of all, is just being closely knitted and in communion with them, having an intimate relationship with them. And that relationship, Jesus says, I want that to start here on earth. And so today we're, we're this series, the whole point of this ser- series is that uh, I'm sincerely, sincerely praying and I'm hoping that you will get to know the Holy Spirit in a more intimate way. Um, that you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. Jesus said, help is on the way. And so uh, just say it out loud, everybody watching, just say, I need help. Uh, As a matter of fact, as I ask you to do that, there's just something inside of you that says, I don't want to do that. The truth is, Jesus said you need help. And if you're honest with yourself, we all need help. And we absolutely need heavenly help. So, so my sincere desire in this series is that you, you grow in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You cultivate a continuous, conscious relationship with the Holy Spirit that he might help you and empower you. Because that was Jesus' desire, and I want to help you walk in that. So the Holy Spirit is asking, uh, will you let me help? Will you let me help? And then the the question is up to you. It's either yes or no. Either you're going to step into this or you're not. But he is saying, I'm here and I want to help you. Uh, At salvation, you and I receive uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are all three inside of us. They are all three there. We've, We've asked them into our heart. It's not like I have the Father and the Son and I don't have the Spirit. 
But Jesus said, and we're going to notice there's a pattern throughout Scripture, that there's this three-stage pattern that's shown where we get a salvation baptism. We experience, many of you have experienced a water baptism. And then third, there's this Holy Spirit baptism. And that's what I'm trying to zero in on today. You see, at this third Holy Spirit baptism, the, the Holy Spirit... Uh, at this baptism, the Holy Spirit wants you and I to surrender our strategies and our solutions for life's problems for the Holy Spirit's powerful strategies and solutions to help us with our life problems. You see, the Holy Spirit says, listen, you're, you're doing this all in your own strength. You're trying to solve all of life's problems You've got the answers and you've got the solution. He said, you're trying to do it in your own strength, but you need my help and I want to help. And the Holy Spirit says, I have divine power to help you. If I were to, to think of an illustration, imagine that you were building a two mile long fence and you were out there and you'd come up with a plan to build this fence. At salvation, you ask Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit to come and live in your life and you're born again. And you're out there building this fence and, and all three of them are with you and they're there. And you've decided that you're going to build this fence using wooden screws and concrete. And in the process, you're going to have to buy, purchase about you know, 200,000 screws and you're going to have to screw this fence together, two miles of it. And while you're sitting there using your screwdriver, you've decided that your best plan is to use a screwdriver to put in 200,000 screws. And as I say that, you're thinking, well, that's kind of ridiculous. It's pretty slow. It's pretty powerless, and it won't go well. And imagine that the Holy Spirit is sitting right there, and the Holy Spirit has a DeWalt uh, power a power drill or a, a screwdriver, a powered screwdriver. And he takes that DeWalt screwdriver and says, I have the power to help you. If you'll let me, I'll help you. But here's what has to happen. You have to say, yes, I want help. And you have to surrender to your way of doing it in order that you might get Holy Spirit help. Can, can you imagine doing your entire life using a screwdriver just doing every screw by hand. And the Holy Spirit says, uh, I have a power drill that we could use to, to drive these screws. And all you have to do is ask for my help. Just yield the way you're doing this fence to the way that I'm asking you to do it. And then you'll, you'll get it done quickly. Uh, you'll have all the power you need. You won't get exhausted. You won't get carpal tunnel from using just a, a manual screwdriver. And in life, can you imagine you're here on earth doing this life in and of your own strength and you have the Holy Spirit right there, but you're not asking for his help. You're not yielding or surrendering to him so he can give you the help that he wants. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. That's what the helper, the promised helper that Jesus said, I'll give to you the Holy Spirit. He wants to help you in that way. Many of us are frustrated uh, when it comes to help, right? Uh, if I ask you the question, uh, you know, uh, have you ever asked anybody to help you? And it didn't go well. The answer would be, yeah, right? I mean, I can think of a ton of excuses. Uh, somebody asked to help me out, and I'm just going, please, you know, I, I don't need any help, you know. And here's the excuses. You, this person's too slow. Um, they don't know much. They don't know as much as I know. They ask me way too many questions. We can't get any work done. They don't pay attention to details. They help, but they're not really doing it right. They're reckless. They have a tendency to hurt people because they're not good with power tools. Uh, they won't stop talking in the process, or they just stand around and they do nothing. And, and the list goes on and on as to why we don't want help. But if we're not careful, we get in a pattern of never allowing anybody to help us. And then in addition to that, we don't even ask the Holy Spirit for his help. But Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit a helper to us. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 12. And as we look through this, you can see, uh, here's the question. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, but who did he promise it to? 
Who is the promised helper for? Well, well, last week, if you listened to our sermon, it was a, we, just, we went over the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, in the early part of Acts chapter 2. 120 disciples got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues. And in that process, 3,000 people gathered. It was such a, a loud and noticeable event that 3,000 people gathered around and saying, what is going on with these 120 people that are speaking in an unknown language? And Peter lifts up his voice, and he's going to answer the question to them. He's going to answer their question, because they're asking, what is going on here? And so Peter raises his voice, all those in speaking tongues uh, stop speaking in tongues. It reminds us that we have the power. We're in cooperation with the Holy Spirit when we yield to his will and his way. They stop speaking in tongues, and then Peter begins to preach. And, and these people are wanting to know what's going on here, and that's where we find ourselves in the context of Acts chapter 2. We're going to read verse 17 and 18, and it's going to answer the question, who is this uh, who, who can have this help that Jesus promised? Let's read along. Peter's speaking. He says, in the last days, uh, Peter is referencing the Old Testament, and he's saying, this is what Joel said. Did the Joel the prophet many years earlier? Here's what he said, and this is what you're seeing happening right now. So he's talking to the 3,000 people. Peter's preaching. He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Say all people. Okay, that's good. Uh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Verse 18, in those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. So, so he, these 3,000 people show up. Most of them are uh, most likely Jewish in heritage, they know their Old Testament Bible. They remember that Joel prophesied this. And now Peter says, what you're seeing happening is this baptism. It's coming. This prophecy is being fulfilled today. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. The people asked, well, if this is true, and this is really what's going on. And then they said, well, if this is the prophecy that Joel spoke, and this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit... Peter had talked to them earlier in this preaching sermon, and he said, you crucified Jesus. He was the Messiah. He rose from the dead. He's been showing himself for 40 days, and now you see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And these people are just bewildered. They recognized, I imagine many of them in the crowd were the ones early on that said, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. The guilt and conviction must have been overwhelming in this moment. And so feeling all this and coming to being convinced and convicted by the Holy Spirit, they say, well, what can we do? What should we do? We've made so many mistakes. We're condemned. We are guilty. The Holy Spirit's convicted us, us of that. What should we do? Here's what Peter preaches in Acts 2, verse 38. This is his answer to the 3,000 that are standing there. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. So he says you must get saved. Number one, that's the salvation baptism. Step number two, there's three steps. There's a three-step pattern developing here. Step number two, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So you should be water baptized. They were familiar with that. John the Baptist was always around baptizing in people in water. So that was step number two that Peter said, they should take. Continuing, he says, then, third step, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, okay? Look at verse 39. They're asking this question. Peter is saying, this is who can have this kind of help. Verse 39, this promise is to you, it's to your children, and to those afar away. Now listen to this. All who have been called by the Lord our God. That, that's a promise for not only them, but for you and I. This promise is for you and I. It's for every believer. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. 
So the Holy Spirit is for everyone. That's, that answers the first question. It's for us. It wasn't a one-time event. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you throughout the New Testament that this pattern of a salvation baptism, a water baptism, and a Holy Spirit baptism is a pattern that's continued for at, at least the next 30 years within the New Testament, and it's also continued all the way until this present age. So, so what is this pattern, and what is the process of the helper, the Holy Spirit? I kind of want to unravel that for you this morning. So many of you may have experienced a water baptism and a salvation baptism, but as I'm challenging you this morning to experience a Holy Spirit baptism, that may have been something that you have not experienced. I want to show you that that pattern exists throughout the book of Acts, the New Testament, and it continues until today, and I'm challenging you to move towards that. So, so let's look at number one. So salvation baptism, I, I think we have it on our screen. It's going to show who does the baptizing. It's going to show what area of, our, uh, of who we are is being baptized. And it's going to help us understand these three baptisms and the need for all three of them. That's what I'm hoping happens. Well, if you look at your screen at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the first, the salvation baptism has to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the baptizing and he baptizes us in Jesus. So nobody comes unto the Father except by the drawing of the Holy Spirit. That, that simply means that nobody comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit has convinced and convicted us that we're sinners, that we're, we're wrong, that we need a Savior, that we have committed a sin and we're not right with God. And so what happens is when the Holy Spirit convicts us and we surrender to the Holy Spirit, Here's what happens. We surrender in our conviction. We start experiencing, uh, we surrender to his conviction, and then we experience the death of what is called condemnation. Jesus said, I came in the world not to condemn the world, but that the, the world might be set free. So, so all of a sudden, I've always felt condemned and all these wrongdoings. I don't feel right before God. The Holy Spirit comes in, the salvation baptism. He's the one that does the baptizing. And here's what happens. The Bible says that I get born again. I become a child of God. So here's what happens. The Holy Spirit, he, he convinces me of my sins. I surrender and I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of all my sins. And then the Holy Spirit baptizes my spirit. What that simply means is that my spirit is dead. So when Adam and Eve were in the garden, their spirit was alive. But when they ate the, the fruit, the fruit of the apple or the fruit of the Bible that, that was wrong, they committed a sin. In that moment, a death happened and their spirit was dead. That means that for you and I, everybody born after that, when you're born, you're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Those are the three areas of, of who you are. And your spirit is born dead. Uh, it, is, it is not active. That's why the Bible uses the phrase, these people were born again. Well, what part of it became born again? Your spirit inside of you comes alive. The Holy Spirit baptizes, saturizes, saturates your spirit, and it comes alive. That's what happens at salvation. And all of a sudden, I made up a body, soul, and spirit. But here's the deal. For many years... My body and my soul, my soul is my mind, my will, and my emotions, they've been in control. And, and when they're in control, I have this tendency to, to sin, to move towards carnal living, to not be the person God created me to be. So in this baptism, the Holy Spirit baptizes me. He, uh, he, I'm born again, my spirit comes alive, and in that moment I experience, uh, this is the eternal part of who I am, right? My spirit lives for eternity. I have eternal life in heaven. I have eternal life here on earth, and when I die and pass away, I will go and spend eternity in heaven because of this baptism of salvation. The second baptism that happens is the baptism of, uh, we call it water baptism, and maybe you've been baptized in, the wa in water. The Bible says that the disciples are the one that does the baptizing. 
So that's why if you're a disciple in Jesus Christ and you lead somebody to Christ, you're more than capable to baptize them in water. Now, this, this baptism is not a spirit baptism. It's a water baptism. It's a baptism of, if you will, the external. It's the body. Your body is physically submersed in water, and your body is baptized. And, and what I want you to notice in every one of these baptisms, there's a requirement of a surrender. So in the water baptism... You and I are publicly confessing that we surrender to Christian living. That's what we're going to start doing. And we start experiencing a a death to our carnal living. All of a sudden, uh, when I get water baptized, the pastor holds me underwater. It's a a depiction of I was dead. My spirit was not alive. I was going to hell. I was not the person God wanted me to be. I, had, I was a convicted sinner, and I was dying. And because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the repentance of sins, I come alive, and, I, and the, the pastor lifts you up out of the water, and it's a symbol of this new life that I'm going to live. And you're making a public declaration that I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit who has given me new life in my spirit, I'm going to allow the spirit, I made a body, soul, and spirit, I'm going to allow my spirit to begin helping me, the Holy Spirit to begin helping me to live the life that he wants me to live, a Christ-like living instead of a carnal living. Now, I don't become perfect overnight. That's why we, I use the phrase, I'm committed to, when I do water baptism, I'm committed to Christ-like living But I still, I'm watching as there's this slow death to the carnal living that I used to do. But I'm repentant. I'm moving in a new direction. Step number three, uh, Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. So this is the Holy Spirit baptized, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. What I want you to notice is the first baptism, the Holy Spirit does that at salvation. Disciples do the baptizing in a water baptizing, uh, baptism. And in step three, Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will go to the Father, and I will ask the Father, and he will send a helper. And Jesus says, I will pour out the Holy Spirit on you, and you will be baptized. And that's the sermon that we spoke last week. Now, notice what happens in this baptism. The first baptism had to do with my spirit being saturated. I'm made of body, soul, and spirit. My spirit is saturated with the Holy Spirit. It comes alive. I'm born again. The second baptism, uh, my body is completely submerged. It's a water baptism, and it has to do with my temporal uh, external body, and it comes alive. I, I, I've got a new life now, and even though I have this temporal body here on earth, I'm going to begin to live Christ-like here on earth, and I've made that commitment. And then on this last baptism, I'm going to need help on the inside. So the first one has to do with the eternal life. The second one has to do with our external life. And this last one has to do with the internal You see, this has to do with a baptism of the soul. You're made up of mind, um, will, and emotions. How many of you know those can get out of control, right? I mean, I can, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but, but here's what happens. My body craves something, and then my soul kicks in, and my soul, my brain starts spinning out, and all of a sudden, I'm doing things that I just shouldn't be doing. All of a sudden, I think I'm all this in a bag of chips, and I've got my whole life planned out, and I don't need anybody's help, and I'm going to do life my way. It's in that moment we begin to get into all kinds of trouble. The Bible talks about this baptism of... I am baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's poured out on me. Jesus pours him out on me. I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, well, how come I, you know, in the Greek language, it says I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm being filled with the Holy Spirit. And and here's what I know. Here's what you know is that it'd be nice if it was a one-time event and that's all that happens. The truth is, is you and I leak. We just leak. I can get filled with the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is telling me what to do. I'm yielded and surrendered to him. Things are going great. And then life hits me with a curveball. I set the Holy Spirit aside. I start doing things in, in and of my own power. And then life falls all apart. And then I need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm constantly, while I'm here on earth, need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. So you see, in this particular baptism, here's what I'm doing. I'm surrendering to the Holy Spirit's control. I'm allowing Him to control me. And then I will experience a death to self-control. I'm learning, if you will, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit to not do everything under my own self-control. I, I, I've got it all figured out and I don't need any help. And I'm surrendering, saying, Holy Spirit, I, I want your help. When it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one of the unique demonstrations and evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what's called speaking in tongues. And you're going to see that as we go through this sermon, this pattern continuing to happen. What's really unique about that is the Bible says in James that the tongue is extremely difficult to, to keep in check, to tame the tongue. We just do not have a very good ability to do that. I'm sure you said things that you wish you'd never said, and we all have. But, but in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, here's what happens. The evidence of, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is I begin, to, I begin to surrender the Holy Spirit, and He gives me sounds and syllables that represent the language of heaven. And He gives me those sounds and syllables, and He asks me if I will repeat them. And then in repeating them, here's what happens. I'm repeating words and sounds and syllables that have no meaning to me. I don't know what they mean. But here's what's happening. I surrender to his control, and I set my control aside. So what happens is I am now using my lips and my tongue to say something the Holy Spirit's asked me to say, and it bypasses my wisdom, my knowledge and understanding, and I just, in total faith and trust, begin to repeat what he asks me to repeat. And it's in that moment of surrendering to Holy Spirit control. And when I surrender to that, I start experiencing a death to the self-control. Because when I'm in control of everything, it doesn't go well. I, you know, if I think I don't need help, life gets bad really, really fast. Now, so listen, I'm going to rip through this last part of this sermon. I just want you to see this pattern is seen in, in the book of Acts several different times. I picked two of them. Well, the last event in uh, Acts chapter 19 happened 30 years later, and it's just trying to show you that this is a pattern that the believers in the New Testament experienced, and this experience is for you. Let's look quickly at eight, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. So, so Peter, uh, Philip, is preaching in Samaria, and here's what happens. He says, but now the people believed, so their salvation, of uh, Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So he was preaching, they got saved, step number one. As a result, many men and women were baptized. So the second baptism uh, is water baptism. So they, they believed that salvation, and then they were water baptized. I want to jump now to the step three, because we just des uh, described the three baptisms. Here's the third one. So, so, so Philip is preaching. They got saved. Uh, the people were water baptized. Look what happens in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria, uh, Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. I want you to, I'm going to read that again. I want you to listen closely. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That verse says they, they experienced a salvation baptism, they got saved, they experienced a water baptism, but as soon as Peter and John got there, and this is, this is uh, much uh, later in time, when they get there, they say, but have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said, no. And so here's what happens, verse 17. Then Peter and John laid hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. 
Peter and John were preaching, and as they went around preaching, as well as Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, they would go in the communities and say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you experienced salvation? They would say yes. They would say, have you been water baptized? Some would say no. Some would say yes. Well, then you need to be water baptized. And then they would ask the third question, have you been Holy Spirit baptized? And the point being is that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're watching um, today, the Holy Spirit loves you. He wants to help you. And he doesn't want you to have two of the three baptisms. He wants you to experience intimate, close relationship with him. That's what the Holy Spirit wants. And he wants to help you. But it'll require you to surrender to doing life and getting his power and his help. If you will, taking the screw gun, the, new, the, the, the electric power drill, and begin to do life with his help instead of doing it just manually with a screwdriver like many, many of us have. I want you to look at Acts 19. This is about 30 years later. Paul comes into the community and he comes into the city of Ephesus and look what happens. We have the same conversation. Watch this. While, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior region until he reached a city called Ephesus. It was on the coast where he found several believers. Okay, so these are believers. They've experienced the salvation. The Holy Spirit's convicted them of sin and they ask for forgiveness. Verse two, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. And notice he's jumping right to it. He's saying, have you received the Holy Spirit baptisms? Listen to what they say. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Sadly, that verse right there represents many believers in many churches. I know of people who have grown up in church their whole life and have never really even heard of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it's not preached or not taught. This is in the Bible. Paul wrote um, half of the books of the New Testament. It, the volume-wise, he, he wrote one-third of the New Testament and Paul is saying, I've had this experience, and I want to make sure you have this experience because we all need Holy Spirit help. Look, look what he goes on. He asks the question, and they go, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 3. He says, then, then what baptism did you experience, he asked. He says, so go ahead. Uh, tell me where you're at. And they replied, the baptism of John. And Paul said, well, John's baptism calls for repentance for sins. But John, told, uh, John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Verse 5. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So in this verse, he walks in and says, okay, you're, you're saved. Uh, have you been water baptized? Well, no, let's get you water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he lays hands on them that they might receive or be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here's what you're going to notice. When, when you walk in and Peter says, hey, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? They go. And when Paul comes in and says, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? How would they know? They say, well, I don't know. Well, they're, they're asking the question, and, and Paul and Peter are saying, have you spoken in tongues? If you've spoken in tongues, that's evidence that you have surrendered to the Holy Spirit. He's filled you. He's poured out in you. And you've spoken the language he's given you to speak. And in that, that when he says, have you spoken in tongues? When he laid hands on them, verse 6. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Now, now listen. The Holy Spirit is, is, when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's about having an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. I think many times people get a little consumed with this tongues part of it. The tongues is great. It's awesome. And it is an evidence that the Holy Spirit, I've submitted, 
I've surrendered control to him and asked him to be my helper. And I've surrendered my tongue to him to help me to pray more effectively. The Holy Spirit wants to help us in so many more areas than just speaking in tongues. He wants to help us to prophesy, to teach, uh, to become the person he's created us to be. The Holy Spirit wants to give us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. He wants to produce that kind of fruit in us. Those are all the benefits of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But part of being baptized and the evidence of this is yielding and surrendering your tongue. And that's what happened here. And so, so this morning, as we, we look at this sermon, I'm asking you the question, um, ha- have you ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you ever been um, baptized in water? Maybe you're watching, you say, Pastor, man, this is heavy stuff, but I don't even know Jesus. I just need to start a relationship with God. Well, the truth is, if you've been listening this morning, uh, the Holy Spirit, if you're an unbeliever and you're just, you're trying to figure this out, you, you think you need a relationship with God, but you don't know how it all works. Today would be a great day for you to experience a salvation baptism. And that, was, that would be to simply say, Holy Spirit, I'm convinced. You're right. I feel convicted that I'm an unbeliever and I need God. Today I want to start a relationship with God. And if that's you, you just have to say, confess your sins and he is faithful to forgive you. All you have to do is pray a prayer. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. I need forgiveness. I repent of my ways. And thank you, Jesus, for paying the penalty for my sins on the cross so I wouldn't have to. And if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says in faith, that, that moment, and you, you meant it with your heart, it says God adopts you as a son and as a daughter, and you're now a child of God. Step number two would be find a local church, uh, become part of it, and let them uh, make a public declaration and have a water baptism. Get baptized in water and make a public commitment that you're going to uh, start living the Christ, uh, living as a Christ follower, and no longer living a life for carnality, but a Christ follower. And then after that, you talk with your pastor and say, Pastor, uh, I'm off to a great start, but I need help. From here to the time I die and, and go to heaven, I need Holy Spirit help. And ask the pastor to pray with you about. Uh, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you're somewhere in that, in that uh, I'd like to pray for you. Right where you're at at home, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to be here at church. And if that's you and you say, oh, Pastor Steve, uh, I want to surrender um, my self-control. I want to set it down and surrender to the Holy Spirit's control over my life. And I want this baptism that Jesus promised. I need help because my life's out of control. I want to pray for you right now. Why don't you just bow your heads and and let me pray for you. Uh, Lord, we love you so much this morning. And Jesus, we thank you that you gave us such a great helper, the Holy Spirit. It was something that you promised to all of us. And for those that are watching today, that have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just as we pray in faith, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and we receive salvation. This gift that you provide, Jesus, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Helper, in faith right now, I ask you, Jesus, to, to just baptize those that are watching. Help them to receive the gift. You're holding the gift of the Holy Spirit out there for them. All they have to do is receive it and say, I surrender Jesus to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right now, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Demonstrate your power so supernaturally in this moment to all those who are sitting at home or sitting in their car or wherever they may be. May they experience Holy Spirit, your amazing power as they set their their self-control down and ask for your help. And Holy Spirit, we understand that 
that there's a cooperation between the choices we make in life and letting you lead. But in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what we're saying, Holy Spirit, is we want you to take the lead. We have a plan for our life, but we surrender to your plan. And we want you to do the guiding, and we want you to provide the power and everything necessary to live out our purpose. And so, right now, Holy Spirit, supernaturally baptize those that want this this morning. They're saying, I want to receive the gift. May they walk this day forward experiencing Holy Spirit help in a way they've never experienced before. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you today. We're so glad you could listen in. Uh, continue to listen to our series. If you haven't heard uh, part one, two, and three, you can go online and see those. Hey, God bless you. Um, come see us someday. We have in-person services. God bless. Thanks so much for joining us today. Make sure to connect with us online and feel free to share this live stream on your Facebook page and we'll see you next week.